for a glimpse into how it's done. And we'll join Daniel, Rupert, and Emma sharing stories about growing up Harry, Ron, and Hermione as the adventure continues. Inside Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So I'll have just a quiet year, Hogwarts. In the spring of 2004, the sprawling complex of sound stages at Leavesden Studios came to life as director Mike Newell began production on J.K. Rowling's fourth adventure, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Hi, hi. hi Harry. I think of the four films is uh, the biggest and greatest adventure. It's the ultimate thriller, which is fantastic. It's so good. It's got wonderful um, set piece scenes. There are dragons and there are underwater terrors and there's lost in the maze. The world is beginning to expand and we get a real sense of just how large the wizarding world is. There are lots of new characters introduced. And this strapping lad must be Cedric, am I right? <laughs> Above everything else, there is the appearance of the true villain for the first time, actually, in his own self. <laughs> Harry in particular is growing up. In fact, Ron and Hermione too. And it's great, I have to say, to be around Dan, Rupert and Emma, seeing them grow, seeing their interests develop. It was only a few short years ago that the three young stars were introduced to the world. Three movies later, Dan, Rupert, and Emma have come a long way. Let's step back in time for a glimpse to where it all began. There must have been hundreds, of millions of people that auditioned, and and they chose me. He's right here. He's right in the corner of frame. It takes an actor of great depth and intelligence to play that role. And Dan Radcliffe is the only 11-year-old I've ever met who has that quality. And you just see it in his eyes. This is a really deep soul. I was one of the biggest Harry Potter fans ever. And just to play Ron in the Harry Potter film has really been fantastic. The Dumbledore gone. Good afternoon. I was like, oh my god, I just stood there. I thought, no, this is all a dream. Pinch me. <sighs> Um, and then it all started happening. Trificus Totalis. Joey, it was scary sometimes. We tested a lot of kids, and we, once we saw these three kids on screen together, we realized that there was an enormous amount of chemistry between them, and we thought, these are the kids. Ah! Harry's first year gave way to a second, and the Chamber of Secrets revealed its deadly mystery. Harry and friends grew up, and so too did the stars of the movie. I was watching Dan and Dan and Rupert standing there, and I thought they're not—they don't stand like we boys anyway. We're gonna be scared out here. It's fantastic. You guys just naturally ended up here. It's just Me, Rupert, and Emma, and some of the other kids have developed really strong bonds now as well. What's going on? What's happening? Second year became the third. Harry confronted the evils of Azkaban, and a new director took the helm. Harry Potter, and together with his friends, there growing up. Go for it. Yeah. Cool. We're the same age, practically, at the same time. So I think we're experiencing a lot of the same feelings, and so we can, I think I can associate with them, really. The relationship between the three kids has changed. They're much older, and that really shows in all sorts of different ways. They're teenagers, and I think there's sort of an ongoing stress. Oh, oh. A lot is put on the relationship between the three of them, and they really rely on each other. Now, in the fourth and biggest adventure to date, Harry and his friends are children no longer and facing greater challenges than ever before. The stories are becoming more complex, darker, and the kids are at an age where they're taking on much more. They can comprehend a great deal. The task is two days from now. Really? I had no idea. At over 730 pages, The Goblet of Fire was J.K. Rowling's longest book to date. Big enough for two feature films, the filmmakers narrowed the focus of their narrative. There was one side of the book which you could string the pearls on, which was the, the thriller side of the story. What is it I'm seeing when I dream? What do they mean? It's a nightmare come to life. Voldemort, the Dark Lord, who was cast down 13 years ago, has been revived by his dark followers. 
you don't see him, but you, you see his hand. He's in a chair at the beginning. You, you just sense his presence in a big armchair. There is a, a terrible, uh, murderous plot, but you don't know what it is. As if in warning, Harry's scar screams in pain. And when I woke up, my scar was stinging. All he knows is that his scar hurts like hell. Um, and the scar and the hurting of the scar and the dreams that he has while the scar is troubling him, they form a kind of chain of stepping stones through the story. And what lies ahead are dark things. Voldemort, the Death Eaters, the world as it was 14 years ago. Those were not good times and we we're on the precipice of times again that could be like that. Worse for Harry, the walls that have guarded him and the protectors who have seen him through are crumbling in the face of evil. There is something that is getting to Harry, that is trying to get to Harry, that has infiltrated Hogwarts. I think whatever's happening, it's bigger than this. And I really think you should go to Dumbledore. Harry's world is completely shaken because Dumbledore, for the first time we see him as an old man who's not at the height of his abilities anymore. Mike said to me, this is a film in which Dumbledore is no longer in control. He gets frightened. He doesn't know what to do. This can't go on, Albus. There's the dark mark. Know this? What do you suggest for never? That's a big thing for Harry because it completely, as it would anyone, unsettles him. And so he kind of loses control of it. With danger spiraling out of control and challenges beyond anything he's faced yet, Harry has to find the courage from within to see the adventure through. Harry is a noble, spiritual warrior. Harry does the right thing, and we would all like to think that we always do the right thing, but we don't. Dragons. That's the first task. They've got one for each of us. Even though there is a really dark part to it, it still has this fantastic sense of humour. Is, is that a student? <laughs> Technically, it's a threat. <laughs> to capture the balance between the suspense and the humor, producer David Heyman enlisted veteran director Mike Newell. You're trying to go back. Oh, you're trying to go back. Okay. Well, there's got to be some physicality in the life. He is amongst the foremost directors of actors, and you know, it's important for us to keep the kids challenged, to, to maintain the high standards that have been set by Chris Columbus and Alfonso Cuaron, and to build on that. And we thought that Mike Newell was the right person to do that. And then? Then all you do is that and that. He's very, very English. He um, wears a, a waistcoat every day, which I just quite like because you don't see enough waistcoats anymore, really. He combines a, a real professorial uh, quality with uh, that of a, a true British public schoolboy. It's in his blood, and I think he brings it out very uh, authentically in this film. I told Hermione to tell you, Seamus told me. In lots of ways, this is a classic English school story. All right, it's wizards and wands and uh, magic and stuff like that, but it is nonetheless a classic English school story. And we're all brought up on those things. You know, I share all the same references. I don't even know I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was great! He's just a real actor's director. And where I am now in terms of acting, well, I just want to learn as much as possible. And he gives very, very detailed notes, which is great because that's what I need. He gives back so much, so much energy. And instead of sitting there in his chair watching the monitor, he's out there and he's doing it and he's giving back energy to the actors. And I think he's great. He's so funny. He's completely crazy. <laughs> Once in a while, it was really worth being a clown in front of those people because there's no point in me being an authority figure. You don't get anything out of people that way. He treated them very much as equals, but he also, you know, he treated them as actors. He was the director, they were the actors, and he was treating them as partners in the process, but he was very much the taskmaster and encouraging them. He saw in them what they could achieve and really elicited you know, the very best from them. Just have a look at this, all of you, because this is the this is how it's it's roughly speaking supposed to work. We talked a lot about how Harry is in this film and sort of the nature of his character and what he's going through and what that would make him feel. And so just through talking about him, we discovered things. So it really was good working with him, particularly from a kind of performance point of view. Glance or two at uh, Hagrid. He's got a very uh, inclusive notion of directing. He walks out of the set in the morning and says, this is what I imagine we're going to do today. This is what I'd like us to do today. I just talk to you all through it. 
and then he goes off for a cup of tea, and then ten minutes later we do our best to do it. Wow, I genuinely think he's brilliant. He's so creative. He's really passionate about making this the best film, and he won't settle for anything less. Noel found inspiration in his young stars. I found each of them funny, just because they were such kind of peppery and vinegary and you know they, each of them has a very strong individual taste i enjoyed that about them coming up hogwarts hosts a triwizard tournament the goblet of fire chooses its champions and harry is swept up in the adventure by a surprise twist of fate and still to come an exclusive scene from the new movie when inside harry potter and the goblet of fire returns